Sci-fi timelines are usually something I look forward to. They have a greater percentage of movies that start off by putting the date right up on the screen. But, as we're about to find out, that doesn't always equate to a simple timeline, as evidenced by the Nemesis series. Let, let's check these out and find out what happens when the guy making your text graphics doesn't quite communicate with the guy who wrote the script. So we're headed back to the glory years of 1993 for Nemesis from Albert Pyun, director of Cyborg, and, and yep, there will be a timeline of that at some point as well. We're immediately told that we're set in 2027, which is crazy because that was 34 years in the future of when this was made, and it's only five years from now. And where's, um, where's my walker? This was one of the first films for Olivier Grunier, I think I, I think I said that correct, and he's Alex Rain, a cop who hunts terrorist cyborgs. Alex is mostly cyborg himself, and after being all messed up, he says it takes them six months to put back together. So, it's either late 27 now, or maybe into 28, but we'll go with later in the year. And he's decided to no longer work for the police anymore. It jumps ahead another year, so we're definitely in 2028 now, and he has long hair and meets up with Freddy, because Freddy always knows where there's a place to party, and they take him in. Max Jenke is here too, along with Jack Death, and they've put a bomb in Snake's heart. I mean, Alex's heart, and he has three days to find his old girlfriend, and damn, check out baby Tom Jane. Sharks come in all shapes and sizes, Billy. See, she was trying to warn him about Deep Blue Sea. She knew. Cho Zen is here too, and damn, so is Shang Tsung, and they try to help out by removing the tracking device in his eye. There's massive gunfights, and it turns out that Farnsworth is the villain and is planning to kill all of the humans so that cyborgs can take over, and is actually just a cyborg duplicate. I should point out that there seems to be some sort of misunderstanding about what a cyborg is. This movie refers to them when it's talking about what's basically androids, just total machines. Someone like Alex, who is mostly human with replacement robot parts, is considered something different, but isn't really given a name. There's more gunfights with lots of sparks flying, and he teams up with Max, while the Hammerheads the good cyborgs that were previously thought to be the terrorists are wiped out. They think they kill Farnsworth, but he's fine chasing them down, and I'm taking a moment here to throw out the fact that in the original version of the script, Alex was a 13-year-old girl and was going to be played by Megan Ward. Pyun was able to find financing, but their one condition was that the lead had to be changed into an adult male. They turn Farnsey into an exoskeleton in a backflip laser blast, who then attacks their ship and they fight, tearing off the top of Alex's scalp. Farnsworth is dropped into a volcano and then replacement Freddy Krueger shows up at the last minute to help repair Alex, and it's then six months later again, so now definitely in 2029. He catches up with Jermaine, and he and Max head to New York to try to take out all of the remaining synthetics. Now, there's an alternate ending that played in Japan and Germany that suggested that Farnsworth was still alive and plotting to kill Alex and Max, giving it a sort of cliffhanger. The current version circulating, including the version that I used, still has the voiceover for that sequence, but doesn't actually show Farns or his conspirator. A sequel followed three years later with 1995's Nemesis 2, again directed by Pyun. The opening tells us that Alex failed to stop the cyborgs, then a voiceover tells us that the war began in 2027, and that was 73 years ago, so it's the year 2100 now. Although, that's kind of weird because it seems to indicate that the intro to the last movie was the beginning of the war, even though the actual conflict seemed to arise a year later after Alex recovered. We're told that 10 years later, the cyborgs won, so in 2037, and they made human slaves. 
So, some rebels created a superhuman, but then, hold up. Uh, 2077? <laughs> that makes no sense. Um, the voiceover literally said 2027 and 73 years ago, so I don't, I don't know what's going on. They try to kill the mother and super baby, but she escapes, so they send a bounty hunter named Nebula. But she sends her baby back through time, and holy crap, this is, this, this is like five minutes into the movie. This, this is a, a lot. We're then back in 1980 in East Africa as Xana and baby Alex land and mom is killed, but the little one is taken in by the locals. It then jumps to 20 years later, so now 2000, 27 years before the opening of the first movie, and they finally traced Alex's whereabouts, so they send Nebula back in time. Baby's grown up now, and she's going through a tribal rite of passage, and Alex is played by Sue Price in her acting debut. And she was previously a female bodybuilder, and she's just, just like ripped. Her future box has a lightsaber knife with a friggin' laser scope, but then Nebs shows up, and if this has been a ripoff of Terminator so far, it throws in a bit of Predator for us too. Alex rescues some women and gets involved in a rebel conflict, and we get our first kinda good look at Nebula, and it's during a pretty damn good stunt. And uh, okay, okay, here we go. Now. Neb says that he's from 100 years in the future, which does line up with 2100, and says it was 20 years to locate her, which again is frustrating because none of that matches that 2077 number. Like the, like the guy saying 73 years could have been talking from the time frame that Nebula went back, so then it would be 2100, but that still doesn't line up with the 20 year 2077 thing. She stabs him and is then double-crossed, so she takes on the nebula one-on-one, -on -one, and she's finally able to defeat it in combat. Emily crashes, and Alex hitches a ride to wait for Judgment Day, or wait, <laughs> wrong movie, I guess wait for whatever this thing is that follows them. Part 3 was filmed back to back with Part 2, so one year later in 1996 we got Nemesis 3 Time Lapse, but I guess it was also called Nemesis 3 uh, Pray Harder, like P-R-E-Y. The opening reminds us that by 2077 cyborgs rule the earth and they're still after Alex, and yeah, it's December 16th, 2077, and they say that she's in East Africa in 1998. So hold up, hold up. Okay, okay, she showed up in 1980, but then it said 20 years later. But it said Cyborg America, so I guess 20 years didn't pass for Alex. For her, it was only 18 years because time travel? Fine. So the second movie is actually in 1998 then, sure. But didn't it take 20 years to find her? How is it still 2077? That's the year she was born. Did they time travel the information back? Forget time lapse. This is, um, time craps. But I guess Farnsworth is back and he goes back to 1998, although they call it present day here. Like, come on, you literally just said he was going back to 1998. Just say that, put that on the screen. Alex is back, wounded in the desert, and she has amnesia now, and it would appear to be just after the ending of the last one, putting that definitely in 98 as well. Farnsworth is here, and he wavers back and forth from looking like Dollman and something from a PS2 cutscene. He tells her that she shot herself and has these eye effects that are hopelessly outdated, even by 1996 standards, and then flashes back to what happened earlier. They send some other cyborgs with wonky aligned green eyes, including these twins, and Farnsworth keeps his team in line with Eskimo kisses. And Alex is searching for a woman she says is a sister, and there's a whole lot of wandering around as she teams up with this crew, including uh, Johnny, who I guess has only one shirt that makes sure to expose his abs, but I guess it's the same as Alex's shirt that doesn't cover her back. 
Nebula comes back, taking on a female form, shooting Farnsworth and pretending to be Alex's sister. He blows up their transport, leading us back to the beginning, and she realizes that she has to get to the future, and it's a cliffhanger. Part 4 came later that same year in 1996's Nemesis 4 Death Angel, or I guess Cry of Angels. It was only released in 96 in Germany though, and in Japan in 97, and didn't arrive on the American market until 1999. We're in the future and Alex is back for the first time not in her torn up outfit. And we're told that by 2080, the war was over. The war was over? Then who was operating in 2100 to send Nebula back in time? That means that the war ended just three years after Alex was sent back in time. Is this, I don't know, is this some sort of alternate timeline now? Does Albert Pion know how time works? And yeah, it's, it's 2080 now, whatever. We're in New York and Alex is here, having gotten to the future and working with the Wishmaster as an assassin and seems to have had an entirely different personality implanted and is hired to kill a mutated guy. And she interfaces with this guy and can I, can I show this? Is, is this okay? I think those are supposed to be belly buttons but I do not know. Turns out that she killed the wrong guy, and you may be saying, hey, this doesn't feel anything like the last two movies. What happened to all those storylines? What about the Cyborg War? Farnsworth, Nebula. Well, it turns out that the sales of the third movie were so low that Pyun scrapped all his plans for it and created a new storyline, and basically just said, well, now Alex is naked every couple of scenes. They scrambled and shot the new script in five days, and there's a hit put out on her, and she keeps seeing the Angel of Death. And seriously, they went two movies without nude scenes, and now it's like this character has never heard of clothing. She fights off some assassins, and then, oh, okay, great, uh, nude again, sure. They double-cross Renardo, and Alex says she's going underground. It is really, really perplexing. If you thought this was weird so far, well, it's about to go off the deep end because the series went away for 21 years, only returning in 2017's Nemesis 5, the new model. But Pyun didn't return to direct, and instead only produced, and it was instead handled. by Dustin Ferguson. We're given a recap of the first film, explaining that the OG Alex would be killed, and that 50 years later, Alex too was born, recapping the second and third film, and then says that she became a killer for hire, and that hope was lost. So we're set after the fourth film, so it's post-2080. A young girl meets Alex, who's looking somewhat less swole, and they say that in 2084, the war was about to end, so I guess that it didn't actually reach peace in 2080 like the last one said, or that was temporary, and the little girl grows up and it's 12 years later. So this is minimally 2096. They decide to go back in time to 2077 through a portal and... It's an end to the propaganda machine. Whoa. Is someone, someone about to do some bad lip, bad lip reading or something? They go to 77, the time frame of the beginning of the second movie, and Ari is hunting cyborgs, and the twins are back, and Ferguson regular newscaster John Walker is here, and Ari is teamed up with a resistance group. They head out into the wasteland, do what appears to be some sort of Tai Chi, uh, occasionally there's some laser shootouts, and Ferg regulars Donna Lee and Mel Novak pop in, and they send in a nebula, and for, for some reason, this bar in 2077 has a 2017 football schedule on the wall. They defeat the neb, and Ari finally comes face to face with the Hammerhead leader, and has to fight Barbie, and she wins, taking down their propaganda machine and saving the human race. 
Oh, and hey, uh, speaking of Dustin Ferguson, turns out that he has a new movie coming out pretty soon called Beyond the Gates of Hell. It's a take on the classic Italian zombie flicks, and if you check it out, I think that you will find that one of the zombies looks a little, um, familiar. So there you have it. It is five movies with quite possibly one of the most confusing timelines I have ever had to deal with. Uh, the time travel aspect of things certainly throws a monkey wrench into the whole works of that, but it also just seemed as if no one ever really knew what time frame it was. Um, I will give a special commendation to part five uh, from Dustin in making a, a very strong effort to try to tie it all back together and to kind of bring the themes of the first movie back into play and sort of get that storyline going again. Because uh, it kind of lost it. I will say I really enjoyed the first movie. A lot of fun, a lot of cool effects, great action scenes. Second film, not so much. Starts to get a little bit more rambly, confusing, not making a lot of sense, and just being endless scenes of people running around in a desert. Third one, basically more of the same. The fourth one is really difficult to watch. Um, and then the fifth one, again, tries to give you that mythology once again. And so I will appreciate that. I, I, I did enjoy that um, for what it was, especially on the budget that it had. Um, so yeah, I, the, these were uh, kind of fun watching. They're, uh, all of them are pretty silly. Parts three and four were the ones I had the toughest time with. They were a little bit on the slower side, but not so great. Uh, but the other ones, uh, entertaining. Uh, yeah, if, if you've seen these and you want to try and make sense of this timeline for me, uh, let me know down below if you have any alternate theories on how this is all supposed to work, because I don't get it. I think I maybe do. I don't know. Uh, put that in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, of course, hit that like button. If you like what you see on the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell so you get notified about when new videos come up. And, of course, check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you went there and helped support this channel. Certainly would help me. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that very, very much. But in the meanwhile, keep on watching. Uh, there'll be another great video coming very, very soon. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.